My college years were some of the best years of my life. Don't get me wrong, I'm very happy with the life I live, but my memories of those four years are eternal. My advice to anyone still in college, don't take it for granted because it definitely flies by. I went to a beach college. Our campus was literally right on the water. This story takes place while I was undergoing pledge with my pledge class. If you don't know, that's basically a full semester of initiation for everyone who got bids to the frat that semester. Most of what happens during pledge is better left undiscussed. Anyway, it was the last week of pledge before we officially became brothers. Typically, this is the week where the fraternity kicks things up a notch, so to speak. For us, it was commonly understood that at some point during the final week, we'd have to undergo the beach challenge. Here's what would happen. The brothers would drive our entire class about 12 miles down the coast on Friday night. Then we'd have an hour to finish a massive keg filled with God knows what. After that, they'd walk us down to the beach, tie all of our wrists together, blindfold us, take our phones, watches, and shoes, and leave us there. We'd have until sunrise to make it back to the house, otherwise, we'd all be dropped. To be completely honest with you, I was pretty nervous leading up to this, but there was really nothing I could do. There was nothing any of us could do. I remember it being oddly chilly the night of, but the excitement of becoming a brother and finally being done with all this nonsense was adrenalizing. The kegs were the easy part, by this point, we were pretty comfortable with divvying up the alcohol and pulling trig if necessary. There were 15 of us. After tying us together, the brothers blindfolded everyone but Cuthbert, who was at the very front of the line. He was to be our eyes, but that's all the help we'd get. Our pledge master was this big Mexican guy named Gideon, but he insisted we all call him Stephen, like the restaurant from Breaking Bad. He was a strange dude. He outlined the rules for us one last time, then joined the rest of the brothers and left. We were now on our own. I won't run you through everyone's names, but my closest friends in my pledge class were Cuthbert, Derek, Magnus, and Patrick. I was at the very back of the line, and Derek was directly in front of me. We began walking with Cuthbert leading us. It was hell. Without our phones, there really was no way of telling how much ground we were covering or how much time we had left. All we could do was keep walking. At first, we tried to liven the mood by talking and cracking jokes, but eventually, that got old. After what I'll call two hours of walking, we were trudging along in complete silence, with the occasional stop for someone to throw up. I started to dissociate. Even the sounds of the ocean grew silent as I walked along, trapped inside my own head. It was completely silent. Suddenly, I felt a sharp tug on the rope around my wrists. So I took a few big steps forward and stopped, assuming Derek had fallen. Derek was a little more clumsy than most, so this kind of thing wasn't super surprising. I didn't really have the strength nor energy to ask him if he was alright, so I just waited. I must have been standing there like a statue for a full minute. Something felt off. I was just about to say something when the rope around my wrist was pulled tight again. I resumed walking, pleased that Derek hadn't passed out. The trek resumed, and I drifted back into my zoned out state, feeling terrible. I prayed we were closing in on the final stretch. We had to be. Just then, I took what must have been my 10,000th step, but something was different. Instead of hitting damp sand, my foot slapped the unmistakable thin layer of ocean water. I took a few more steps, and the water got deeper, reaching up to my ankles. I was confused. Why would Cuthbert be leading us into the water? The rope pulled tight again, meaning Derek and everyone else in front of me was continuing to walk, 
so I did the same. I guess I figured someone needed to wash off their feet for whatever reason. If no one else was complaining, though, I definitely wasn't going to start. The water remained ankle height for a while, advancing and receding with the sway of the waves. Just then, though, I felt the water begin to rise again until it was comfortably around my shins. Cuthbert was definitely screwing with us, which for the life of me, I couldn't understand. Why? Wasn't this stupid activity painful enough? The water was only going to slow us down. Seconds later, I began to pick up on a faint sound in the distance. I craned my ears and began to recognize it. It was the sound of an idling boat engine. As we continued to walk, the drone of the engine only got louder, meaning it was getting closer, or I was getting closer to it. I was starting to get really uncomfortable. The water was almost up to my knees at this point. Finally, I broke what must have been hours of unspoken silence. Guys, what the hell are we doing in the water? I waited, confused as to why no one was answering me. Guys, I asked again in a more concerned voice. Still, nothing. I could feel panic begin to set in. Suddenly, my blindness was suffocating. I had to look around. I reached my wrists up towards my eyes in an attempt to undo my blindfold. As I did so, the rope yanked away from me, forcing my arms back down. I cursed, plunging my head down towards my fingers and undoing my blindfold before the rope could be jolted away from me again. To my horror, Derek wasn't the one guiding me. Instead, I found myself staring at a random middle-aged man holding the frayed end of the rope tied around my wrists. I stared in shock at a severed rope in his hand, and that's when I realized what had done the cutting. A long, rusty kitchen knife sat in his left hand. Past him, there was a boat bobbing in the water, and I could make out three more silhouettes towering on board. I screamed bloody murder before he had a chance to react yanking my arms upward as fiercely as I could. At the same time, I lifted a foot out of the water and kicked his chest with all the strength I could muster. Luckily, the rope broke free from his grip. He grabbed my shirt to try and cushion his fall, but the fabric gave way with a deafening rip. He yelled as he plunged into the water with a huge chunk of my white pledge t-shirt, but I was already moving as fast as I could toward dry land, my wrists still tied. A few seconds passed before I heard a splash from further away. Someone had jumped off the boat. I didn't even look behind me, I just kept moving. I was about halfway to the sand when something whizzed right past my head, maybe a few inches from my right ear. It was the knife. I watched it shoot past me before disappearing into the water. I was in complete shock, but the adrenaline was doing its job. I got to land and, for the first time, looked back. There were two men in the water and two on the boat. They weren't chasing me anymore, just staring lifelessly in my direction. The closest man was still holding on to the white piece of my shirt that had torn off in the fray. I didn't waste another second. I ran up the beach and made it to the street. By this point, it was past sunrise, but my frat was the last thing I was thinking about. I flagged down the nearest car, and after pleading to use their phone, I called the police. It was no use. By the time the cop showed up, the four men were gone, presumably off to wherever in that tiny little boat of theirs. I lied to the cops about what happened, worried that there might be repercussions for the frat. Luckily, they didn't ask questions. I didn't get too much crap from my frat brothers. They were actually more pissed at Cuthbert for not realizing what had happened, even though he swears he didn't hear a thing. After that, I became a brother, and things went back to normal well, normal for a while. A few weeks later, 
a couple of the guys and I were playing beach dice in the sand behind the house when Magnus noticed something in the distance. There was a stick poking out of the sand, and tied to that stick was the white piece of cloth that had been torn from my t-shirt. The design on the ripped stick was unmistakable, it was my shirt. To this day, I have no idea how they knew which frat I was in. My brothers think they might have recognized the piece of my t-shirt, but I have a more sinister theory. I think it's very possible that they knew our frat would be sending us pledges on that beach that night, helpless and blind. I think they very well could have planned the whole thing around that stupid tradition, swooping in and kidnapping whoever they could. I was just unlucky enough to be in the back, which still gives me chills to this day. I still wonder what might have happened to me had I gotten on that boat. The police, as always, were useless. It's been nearly a number of years, they never found anything. When I was a freshman in college, I took a chemistry class. It was really difficult for me. The tables were arranged in groups of four. I sat at a middle table, at the left side all the way to the end. Next to me was a guy named Albert. He was very awkward, he gave me Reddit moderator vibes. To describe his appearance, he was like 5 feet 8 inches, a little overweight, and had a really ugly patchy beard, but he knew his stuff in chemistry. I think he was just good in school overall. We started to talk in a pretty cordial way when he noticed I was struggling in class. I would ask him for help, and he started offering to do my homework for me. He even let me cheat off him on tests. I never got any kind of flirtatious vibes from Albert, but that might have been because he was just too awkward to flirt in person. He eventually asked for my number so that he could send me homework-related stuff. Obviously, I gave it to him. He was helping me out a ton and didn't give off any threatening vibes. He just seemed a little reclusive. Fast forward to the last day of class, and Albert did something completely unexpected. He asked me if I wanted to go on a date with him after class. I had no physical attraction to Albert in the slightest, and our personalities were complete opposites. But he did help me throughout the semester maintain an A, so I had to let him down super politely. I lied and told him I was going away to Miami for the next couple of weeks and wouldn't be around. He right away responded, what about when you get back? I felt like two weeks was long enough of a gap in seeing each other where he would probably lose interest, so I said, yeah, I could be around or something like that. He responded with a really cringy, cool, as he nodded his head in response. From here till the end of class that day was really awkward for me. After class, I left straight for my car and drove right home. I was a commuter, not a dormer, so after the last day of class was over, that was it. It was Thursday, and my other friends who went to the same school wanted to go out that night, so we hit town. At some point, I got a text from Albert. He asked, when are you going to Miami? I told my friends all about Albert while we were drunk, how he got me an A but now he wanted a date. My friends joked that I should just go on the date with him to be nice. I joked back sarcastically, yeah, for sure. I told myself I'd respond to it later, but I was drunk and completely forgot. The next day, I woke up to two follow-up texts, one with question marks, and then the next one, you're going to ignore me now that you don't need me anymore, right? So I replied, hey, I'm sorry, I was packing. I'm going to Miami today. He replied almost instantly, saying, okay. Obviously, there was no Miami trip, but he shouldn't have found that out. Later that night, my girls and I went out again. While out, I got a scary text from Albert saying, I thought you said you were going to Miami tonight. I almost dropped my drink when I saw this. 
I showed it to my girls, and they were all freaked out just like I was. I replied to Albert, what do you mean? And he replied, nothing, forget it. I just don't like liars. I genuinely was scared that I was being stalked. I looked around the whole bar, but he wasn't there, at least as far as I knew. So, what the hell, I just didn't answer at that point. I never planned on answering him again. It was until late that night, shortly after I got home, like literally taking my shoes off inside, that there were knocks at the door. It had to be like 1 a.m. I said, who is it, and it was Albert on the other side. He said, it's me. I wanted to scream. I was home alone. I yelled through the door to leave or my dad would come out and kick his ass. That seemed to work, as he didn't knock again. I texted everyone I knew about the situation, my family, all my friends. I was horrified. Some suggested calling the police. I said I would go to the nearest station tomorrow, but tomorrow didn't even come yet when I received a super long, disgustingly weird, and creepy text from guess who. I was appalled when I picked up my phone and read it. This is what it said, I'm feeling a lot of emotions right now after being used by someone for months and then lied to. Hurt and anger are two of them. I thought from the start of the semester in chemistry class that our chemistry was through the roof, no pun intended. I must say I am hurt that you would make up something as elaborate as a two-week Miami trip just to avoid going out with me, even after I stuck my neck out for you all semester and risked my own academic standing. I definitely have noticed the way you looked at me sometimes in class, and I can't pretend there wasn't a hint of interest there. All I'm asking for at this point is for one date. That's it. I'm not asking for your hand in marriage, though I surely would be quite an ideal husband to have if I do say so missile. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt that you needed more time to think over the prospect of going on a date with me. I know how much I have to offer, much more than these losers all over campus. If you want, I can come back to your house, and we can talk about it in person. I am only making this offer once. I'm just very crushed to feel like I wasted so much this semester for nothing in return. Yours truly, Albert. I sent this to everyone. I didn't care that it was 3 a.m. I called my dad until he picked up, and I told him how scared I was. After he read the text, he took it upon himself to send a lengthy text of his own and attempted to call him like 10 times, but Albert was clearly too much of a coward to pick up that phone call. I also went to the police station the next day with the text saying I wanted to press charges, and one of the people working there said that Albert would be contacted. Albert never picked up any of the calls from the police who were trying to get him to come in for questioning, nor did he answer any of their text messages. Albert completely disappeared. I never heard from him again. Between the police contacting him and my dad's pretty scary texts and voicemails, that basement dwelling creep was probably himself. Luckily, I never saw him on campus again or anything like that, but I can say I know what it's like to deal with an actual stalker. It's been eight years since I graduated from college. I went to Cooper Union, a small technical school smack dab in the middle of Manhattan. Going to school in New York City was amazing, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. We didn't have many frats back then, so I was sure to join whichever one I could, just to ensure that I'd have parties to go to and whatnot. I was a relatively normal kid, so it wasn't too difficult to get a bid. Most of the pledge events were pretty tame, but I would soon find out what they were compensating for. I hope I don't get in trouble for divulging the story, but it happened so long ago that I figure it's safe to talk about. I doubt my old frat is still making their pledges do this, I certainly hope they aren't. 
Anyway, the big thing that we did during our initiation was a subway crawl. I can't remember where exactly this was, but there was an old abandoned subway station that teenagers would typically explore. Our frat would make us enter from one of the active platforms, walk to the abandoned one, take some pictures, and then continue to the next active platform. We'd been given subway schedules to ensure that there was no chance a train would come around while we were vulnerable. We'd have plenty of time to get onto the abandoned platform, wait for one train to pass, and then make it to the next station. I know what you're probably thinking, but no, we didn't have to run from a train. The route was planned pretty well, and we all had a lot of leeway when it came to traversing the track. All we had to do was avoid the dangerous third rail, and we'd be okay. I had been a big fan of urban exploring before college, so this was honestly more exciting than nerve-wracking for me. It was some random weekday at like 3 a.m. when our frat brothers made us go down into the subway. I'm pretty sure they picked this time because trains were very infrequent, and we'd be protected at all costs. There were about 10 of us. I'm telling you, it was a pretty small school. You don't need to know everyone's name, but I should mention that my closest friend in my pledge class was an Albanian dude named Baron. He's the funniest guy you'll ever meet. My friends and I always said he should try and do stand-up comedy. He also smoked a crap ton of pot, which is important for this story. The group of us made our way into the subway and scathed. Baron and I brought up the rear because everyone else was too scared to do so. It was really dark in there, and our frat brothers had only given us two flashlights to share. Those flashlights and a single cheap film camera were all we had. At first, I was entrusted with one of the flashlights for being in the back, but I quickly gave it up to one of my pledge brothers who was whining about not being able to see. Not even 30 seconds into the walk, Baron had his first genius idea. He pulled out a pre-rolled joint from his jacket and grinned, motioning for me to stop. I don't have enough to share, he whispered, flicking his head in the direction of the other guys who hadn't noticed what we were doing. Against my better judgment, I obliged. Heck, when was I going to get the chance to light up in a subway tunnel again? The two of us smoked while we watched the other guys travel further away from us, their echoing laughter beginning to fade out. We finished the pot, and we were a considerable distance behind the pack. Baron's stuff was really strong, and I found myself a little more absent-minded than I wanted to be. My tolerance was definitely not as high as his. The two of us picked up the pace to catch up with the rest of the group, but Baron noticed something in our way. We didn't have a light, so all we could see was the silhouette of someone in the dimly lit tunnel. I strained my eyes a little more. There was definitely a person in there, just standing motionless in the middle of the track, facing us. It was honestly a little creepy. David called out, his voice piercing the silence of the tunnel. The person on the track didn't respond, just then, David's voice called back to us from further up the line. The two of us froze. This person in front of us was a stranger. As if David's voice was some kind of switch, the person on the track started full-on sprinting toward us. The two of us turned around and bolted back the way we came. Being as high as I was, I felt like I was going to have a panic attack. The figure's sprint was eerily silent, as if we were being chased by a shadow. This guy must have been impossibly light. Baron's grip on my arm tightened, his goofy confidence completely gone. Faster, he hissed, the fear in his voice mimicking my own. I knew we still had some time before the next train came, but running in the wrong direction just felt wrong. Baron must have thought the same thing because he frantically pulled me to the side, motioning for us to cross the divider onto a different track. In hindsight, we probably could have continued running back to the original station, but
but I was so high that I just followed Baron blindly. We made it across the divider and sprinted back in the direction of the abandoned station. Things were even more terrifying now, though. We had literally no idea when a train was going to barrel down towards us on this track, but at least we were heading in the right direction, I hoped. Baron's maneuver was enough to shake whoever was chasing us, but apparently, it wasn't. Whoever was behind us also crossed the divider and kept running after us. The problem was, there were only a few places where the divider could be crossed, so we'd have to pray we found another one before a train came. Turning around to the one we just used was no longer an option. My heart was thumping, but Baron and I were able to widen the gap between us and our pursuer. We kept running, looking for a place to cross, but with no luck. Baron started cursing repeatedly, and I started feeling like throwing up. We kept running, still searching for a place to cross. Just then, the track started vibrating, and we could see light beginning to poke through at the distant end of the tunnel. A train was coming. We were screwed. I considered turning around and just fighting whoever was behind us, but then Baron screamed, right here, running toward the divider. By some miracle, the next crossing point was right in front of us, and the two of us crossed back to the original track. We sprinted another 30 yards and caught up with the rest of the guys who were on the platform. Baron explained the whole thing while I leaned over and threw up. Not even 30 seconds later, the train on the other track zoomed by. Baron and the rest of the guys were ready to confront whoever was chasing us. No one showed up, though. We thought the worst, but just then, we heard another crazed yell from somewhere in the distance. To this day, I still have no idea how that person avoided the train. We waited for the train to pass on our track and then sprinted the hell out of there. In hindsight, Baron and I probably just encountered some homeless guy who was drugged out and might not have even posed a threat to us. The fear took over in that moment, though, which I guess explains the stupid decision we made to cross over the divider. I'm sure the two of us also could have fended that guy off, but I'm glad we didn't have to. It was junior year of high school and it was the last day of school. A lot of people cut school this day or left early after lunch period. My friends and I were some of the latter. It was a stormy, dark day. A bunch of people from our grade originally planned to hit the beach on the last day of school, but that was obviously cancelled. So my smaller core group of friends decided to do something else. There used to be an abandoned elementary school in town that hadn't been used for like 10 years. There were plans to tear it down by the year's end. So, Still wanting to do something fun on the last day of school, we all agreed to break into the building in just, around exploring. There were no cameras in that old building, and on a stormy day, no one would be outside monitoring the place or anything. So we all left after lunch period. Our friend Darius already had a car and his license, so he drove us all to the abandoned school. The school was in the middle of a neighborhood, not on any main roads for anything. There was a back parking lot covered by overgrown bushes and trees on one side and the walls of the school on two other sides. It was a perfect spot to park and go unnoticed. The place wasn't boarded up or anything, it was just locked up. Darius had a baseball bat in his trunk that he took out to smash one of the windows of the school. I was honestly so nervous that even through the pouring rain, one of the houses over the fence would hear the smashing sound. We all watched and nervously laughed as Darius swung the bat into the window in front of the car. After a few good swings, smashing it, he pushed away the stray pieces of glass stuck to the frame with a bat and then he waved us over. We one by one climbed through the window into the school. My logic was that the school was being torn down anyway, 
what's a broken window matter? We all were inside the building now. The window we climbed through was actually one of the windows for a classroom. A lot of stuff was still left in the room, including the desks and some decorations on the walls. Based on the decorations, it looked like we were in a fourth or fifth grade classroom. It was very surreal to be inside of what was once an active classroom where little kids would come to learn, now nothing but a cold, dark and abandoned room, collecting dust, waiting to be destroyed. The sounds of thunder and lightning outside also added to the surreal feeling of it all. There were no lights on in the building, power to the place was likely cut completely. We anticipated this, though, the flashlights on our phones were plenty to get around and see. Even without them, it wasn't completely pitch black in there, as even though it was a dark day, some light W is still creeping in through the windows and doors. We started traversing the hallways, going from room to room. Each classroom was still full of desks and chairs that hadn't been sat in for probably a decade. We all four were in the same classroom when there was a sound that echoed down the hallway and into the classroom. We all went silent and turned off our lights for a moment. After a flash of lightning, we slowly accepted that it was probably nothing, so we continued on. We just went from room to room as our wet shoes all squeaked on the floors. Sneaking around wasn't really possible. A lot of things in the school were visibly decaying. You could really tell no one had stepped foot in there in ages. As we neared the corner of the hall, I turned around just to look back down the other way. At the doorway of one of the classrooms, it looked like there was something sticking out from the classroom. I asked my friends to also look, their lights might help see what it was. When all four of us were pointing our phone flashlights toward the door, whatever that thing we were seeing was retracted into the classroom. All four of us quietly went, oh, amongst ourselves, and we started running down the intersecting hallway. We stopped when we were far enough away. It seemed we were in the kindergarten wing now. Then we heard another sound echo from down the hallway. It seemed we weren't alone, but who could be in here was the question. The place was locked up and every light in the building was off. The sound scared us into going into the first classroom we could find and shutting the door. It was indeed a kindergarten classroom. We were now concerned we'd get in trouble, so we waited in silence with our flashlights off. The rain was still coming down hard, and there was still thunder and lightning crashing every 20 seconds or so. Suddenly, the door to the classroom clicked open, and someone pushed it as it eerily creaked to a fully open position. We didn't see anyone at the doorway, though, and the hallway was almost pitch black. We all tried our best to stay quiet, and then slowly something appeared through the doorway. It was the shape of a head. We all saw it, and when there was another flash of lightning, we saw what it was, it was, in fact, someone's head looking into the classroom directly at us. I started apologizing for all of us, saying we're leaving. The person at the doorway didn't move. They motionlessly and almost lifelessly just peered around the doorway into the classroom. Darius asked, do you work here? No response. Darius had to this moment clearly. He handed me the bat as he struggled to unlock one of the windows to slide it open just enough to crawl through. He crawled out first, then my other two friends, and I was last. Before I crawled out, I looked back one more time at the head at the doorway. I crawled through as quickly as I could, fearing I'd hear the person run up behind me and grab my legs. Once I was out, I ran to catch up with my friends who were already booking it back to Darius's car. We drove out of there in a hurry and never looked back. The building was torn down later that year and has since been turned into a park. We never got in trouble for breaking in. To this day, we have no idea if that was some kind of worker or just some random person. 
Either way, it was extremely creepy behavior on their part. This happened to me about a year ago today, which is why I'm writing about it now. I'm a 19-year-old college student that was in the middle of joining a fraternity on my campus. I go to a big party school down south, and Greek life is taken very seriously there. For privacy reasons, I'll spare the specific details, but this particular night was my initiation, meaning the night that me and my class of 20 students would officially become brothers of the fraternity. During the process of joining, which lasts a couple of months, the brothers would make us do odd things like blindfold us and take us to strange places. You know, typical hazing stuff. This was one of those nights. We were blindfolded and left the frat house around 10.30 p.m. The brothers took our phones and drove us to a mystery location, split between a couple of different cars to make sure we all got there. On the way over, they made us try and sing some corny song while it blasted on full volume. We always had to do these annoying tasks while blindfolded, I guess as part of the whole hazing thing. Anyway, after about 20 minutes of driving, the car stopped, and I heard the doors open and close. I felt a hand grab my arm and silently usher me out of the car. We walked probably 200 feet, where I was then told to sit down and be quiet. I was sitting on grass, so I assumed we were in a field or something. I could also tell I was sitting near people because I heard them sit down, and I also heard the brothers telling each of them to be quiet. After about a minute of sitting in silence, I heard a voice speak to all of us, saying a bunch of fraternity-related things, but mostly about how we were deemed worthy of becoming a part of the brotherhood. Then, over the course of like 30 minutes, I sat in silence, occasionally hearing the sound of footsteps and movement around me. I figured they might have been doing the final steps of initiation with each person individually, like walking them away to talk to them in private. I didn't know for sure, but being blindfolded meant I was just left to my imagination. There was a time when the footsteps went away, and all I was left with were the sounds of crickets and leaves rustling through the night breeze. I began to grow uncomfortable as it must have been like 20 minutes that I was sitting there in silence. Then suddenly, I finally heard the footsteps of one of the brothers walk up to me, and I felt a hand grab my wrist and lead me away. He didn't say a word, and neither did I. I just wanted to get it over with so I could take the stupid blindfold off. While we walked, I could feel the ground below me go from grass to more rough terrain. I could tell we were walking through a forest as I felt branches and shrubs scrape against my body. We were walking for some time, and at one point, the blindfold became very uncomfortable around my eyes. I told him this and asked if we could stop for a second so I could adjust it. He stopped and let go of me as I stood there rubbing my eyes from under the blindfold. I heard a deep, raspy voice say, take it off. I hesitated for a second, not knowing what to say. His voice threw me off, as it didn't sound like a voice I recognized. Needless to say, I took it off, and what I was greeted with was not what I imagined. I was standing face to face with some tall guy dressed in all black, wearing a vendetta mask. I let out a sharp yell and jumped back. A part of me thought this was just some messed up hazing prank but before a word could even escape my mouth, he lunged at me, yelling that he was going to take me with him. We wrestled on the ground, and I could tell he was trying to choke me out. With all my strength, I threw him off of me, got up, and bolted in the opposite direction, using nothing but moonlight to guide my way back. My heart was beating a million times a minute, and I kept looking back, fearing that he was following me. I eventually heard people yelling my name and nearly ran head-on into one of the fraternity brothers. I told him and scrambled, broken words that some random guy wearing a mask had led me into the forest and tried fighting me. 
But before I could warn them any further, five or six of them rushed past me with flashlights, looking to chase after him. One of them stayed with me to calm me down and walk me back to safety. When we made it out of the woods, I realized we were in a backyard, presumably one of the brothers' houses. I saw nearly the whole fraternity standing out on the porch, looking at us in shock. I asked them what the hell was going on. They said that since it was dark and I was the last in line, the brother who was supposed to be escorting me had somehow overlooked that I was there and completely forgot about me. They said a couple of minutes later, one of them thought they saw movement in the woods, which was around the same time that they realized I wasn't in my group. I was in such shock I couldn't even be pissed about it. None of them knew who that man was, but some of the brothers speculated it could have been a brother from another fraternity. Shortly after, flashlights emerged from the trees, and I saw them running back towards us. They told everyone to get the hell out of there and get back to the campus immediately. They didn't ask questions, they locked up the house, and one of them got on the phone with the police. The whole car ride back, I was bombarded with questions, and I answered them the best I could with my mind still racing. I wondered where that man came from, why he was wearing a mask, and what he could have been leading me to. I made up scenarios in my head, like how it could have been a brother from a rival fraternity trying to steal me before I was initiated. That doesn't explain why the brothers locked up the house and called the police, though. I didn't find out until the next day when one of the brothers who ran after him told me what they found in those woods, and what they found was not what I expected, as they were running, they saw a light in the distance. They grew silent when they got closer and realized it was a bonfire in the middle of a clearing. Standing around the fire were several people dressed in all black and wearing white vendetta masks, chanting and throwing things into the fire. One of the brothers stepped on a loud branch, causing all of the masked men to turn and face them. They froze up like something straight out of a horror movie. The mysterious men suddenly started running in their direction. They fled and made it back, where they told everyone else to leave and call the police. It seemed as though we had somehow walked ourselves into some cult ritual meeting of some sort. I couldn't sleep for many nights after and tried my best to rid my mind of the situation. However, something that I heard from the fraternity a few days later sent shivers down my spine. While a few of them were playing football in the backyard of that same house, they found a white vendetta mask hanging from a tree nearby. They called the police, and the cops took it for evidence and examination. I'm not sure if those guys were ever caught or if the police even made anything of it. I'm also not sure what the hell those weird people were doing in those woods. I've been thinking about this experience a lot recently, and I'm glad that I was left with nothing more than a crazy story. This was something that happened so long ago that a lot of details are a little blurry. It's not like it happened yesterday. I'll try my best to fill in smaller details that I don't fully remember with how I best remember things played out. It was the last day of school. I was in the fourth grade. Fourth grade was the last year in our elementary school where kids had to be picked up by their parents, fifth graders were allowed to walk home on their own. My mom would always be the one to pick me up on the last day of school. My friend Dante and I had a playdate planned to celebrate the last day of school. Dante wasn't in my class this year, but we had been friends since kindergarten. He was in a different dismissal hallway from me. After school was over, we single filed lined up and walked to the exit door at the end of the hall where we waited outside by our teacher, Miss Cayley. I waited for Dante's dad to appear from the crowd of parents shuffling in and out of the parking lot next to the doors. Then I heard my name, Titus, Titus. I looked over and saw a man waving at me. As he approached, 
He introduced himself as Dante's uncle and said he was picking me up. I went over to Miss Cayley and said, I'm being picked up. She asked, where is he, sweetie, and I pointed to Dante's uncle who waved at Miss. Miss Cayley dismissed me, and I went with the man. He led us through the crowd and was a very quick and jittery talker, like he spoke fast and had a bit of a stutter. He was walking incredibly fast, it was almost hard to keep up with him with my backpack on. He explained to me that his brother, or Dante's dad, was working later than expected, so he was driving me back. We got to his car, which was a dark red hatchback type car from what I remember. It took me this long to acknowledge the giant elephant in the room, where was Dante? Why weren't we picking him up too? The man turned to look at me in the back seat and said that Dante was already at his house. I was shy around people I didn't know, especially adults, and I wasn't one to openly speak my mind if I was confused, but I was very confused. This was making less and less sense the whole drive. The man kept yapping, telling stories of his days in elementary, asking me questions like what sports I played, what we were learning in class. If I had to guess, we were in the car for about 10 minutes, which honestly, for our town where houses were right on top of each other, was a while. My house was a five-minute walk away from the school, and we were definitely in an area I wasn't familiar with. When he parked the car in front of his house, his house looked pretty normal to me from what I remember. He led us inside and shut the door, locking it behind us. It was really, really dark inside the place, and I realized why all the curtains were shut. It almost felt like it was nighttime in there, especially because the only source of light was a dim lamp in the corner of the room. He then looked at me and smiled. I asked, where's Dante, and he started acting really jittery and nervous seeming. He said something like, oh, I think he's downstairs playing video games. Give me a second. Wait here. He then disappeared into a nearby room, and I heard a door open and then footsteps descending into a basement. I know my heart was already racing, I knew I was in danger. I went to the door to quietly try to open it, but I couldn't. It had some kind of lock that must have needed a key. I really started to panic now. Yet, I still probably held out a little bit of hope that Dante would be coming up those stairs, but I knew the chances of that were slim. I regretted entering that house. I did the only thing I could think to do, I went to the kitchen and found a phone hung on the wall. I picked it off the receiver and dialed 911. The first thing I said when they answered was, in a whisper, please come to this house. I've been kidnapped. They heard me, they acknowledged me, but I didn't say another word. I hid the phone under a towel in the corner of the room with 911 still on the line. I hurried back to where the man left me as I heard his footsteps coming back upstairs. Then he called my name, saying, come down. Dante is down here. Then there was a pause. He repeated my name, and when I didn't answer, he came up the stairs fully to look at me. He asked me if I was okay. I felt so sick and was so scared. I hated myself for walking into the situation and not being wiser. I asked in a very scared voice if I could leave, and I remember the change in his face. His fake friendly smile disappeared as he realized that I was no longer falling for this. He walked closer to me in a gentle manner until he was close enough to grab my wrist aggressively, and he started pulling me towards the basement. I screamed and cried and he screamed at me, I'll let you go if you stop and behave. So I listened. I went down the stairs, and halfway down, the door slammed shut behind me and I heard it lock. I walked fully down the stairs to an empty, unfinished basement with a concrete floor and one singular support beam in the middle of the room. 
There was a depressing yellow glow in the room from one exposed light bulb hanging on the ceiling. If there was a place you'd imagine kidnapped children to go, this would be it. Med shut behind me and I heard it lock. I walked fully down the stairs to an empty, unfinished basement with a concrete floor and one singular support beam in the middle of the room. There was a depressing yellow glow in the room from one exposed light bulb hanging on the ceiling. If there was a place you'd imagine kidnapped children to go, this would be it. I heard his heavy footsteps upstairs, you could hear everything in this house. I don't know what he was doing, but I heard him walking around for a while. Then he came to the basement door, opened it, and called down asking if I'm hungry. I replied, no, not wanting him to go into the kitchen and see the missing phone. He shut the door and locked it again. I sat down there, waiting with my heart in my throat. Then I heard it, the doorbell ringing three times from upstairs, followed by banging sounds, which were definitely the sounds of police banging on the door. I refrained from screaming until I heard the front door open, but I never heard the man's footsteps approach the door. The doorbell kept ringing and I kept hearing the bangs. This went on for some time until I heard a really loud bang sound and then multiple heavy footsteps and multiple screaming voices. I started screaming for help as loud as I could at the top of the stairs, banging on the door. The door was unlocked, and a police officer on the other side grabbed hold of me and hurried me outside. There were at least three cop cars outside. I had to tell everything to two of the cops outside as we waited for my parents to show up. The man from inside was brought outside and into a cop car in handcuffs. That was the last time I ever saw him. When my parents arrived on the scene, my mom was bawling her eyes out. There had already been a hullabaloo at the school as cops were called and Dante's dad realized what happened. This man was a work associate of Dante's father. When he somehow learned that Dante's dad would be picking Dante and me up from school on the last day, he seized the opportunity to do what he did, a complete sick. I don't know how he found out what I looked like. As I got older, I never really asked for more details because I try not to think about it. My mom went to counseling with me for months after this incident. Let's just say my parents didn't have kind words for Miss Cayley for not verifying if I actually knew the person picking me up. If I didn't think to call the police before he basically threw me in that basement, I know for a fact I'd be dead right now. This was like 17 years ago, that man might be out of prison for all I know.